Helping keep modern Manx history alive. Well, Nick, you, you've seen and you heard the allegations made about a letter that you sent out to people this morning in your department, and uh, the threat is there, apparently, that there's going to be redundancies made in the railway department. Yes, indeed, I've, I've seen that, and I think it's time to useful time to just comment and correct a few little points, uh, not to engage in too much, but just to get some, some of the facts straight. Uh, firstly, I met the staff this morning myself, uh, along with some senior managers, uh, and we met a total of 34 staff. Now, this is initial consultation whereby we are saying to people, we've got a problem. We don't expect next year to have enough money to pay all the bills we have to face in the department. We have to look at options, and one of the things we're looking at is the possibility that we may have to reduce our staffing budget. Now, of course, we've looked around the department. Of course, we have a chief minister who has quite understandably said he doesn't want us to cut services. The minister is very much alive to that. We also have to try to uh, make savings where we can through efficiency gains. We've already made lots of savings. We have vacant posts across the department at all sorts of grades. So we've got some very senior posts that are currently empty. We lost um, posts in the Villa Marina through natural wastage because we have staff who resign or retire, and we haven't been filling those posts. That gives extra work to the people who are left, and I'm very grateful for their support. Uh, but uh, in the public transport division, we had been engaged on a process of restructuring anyway. We had a three-year programme that was designed to save 20 posts. Last year, we saved six jobs. We did that because, as with other areas, people resigned, retired or left us. We were able to achieve our six vacancies last year through that process. This year, we were planning to make seven savings and next year, another seven posts. However, the financial target we expect to be set at February Tinwald means that we probably won't be able to afford to pay the salary bills. So we have offered to bring forward those two years into one. So instead of a year of seven and another year of seven, we need to make more than seven this first year. Probably 11 jobs potentially might need to be saved. But that's posts and actually it's the money to pay them. We don't need less people, we just haven't got the money to pay them. So what we're trying to do is to engage in the process with our staff and say, look, how could we do this? We have to bring it forward, and because we're bringing it forward, we can't do it through natural wastage. We don't expect enough people to leave us voluntarily, especially as people worry about the economy, sometimes without foundation, but you know, clearly they won't want to, to leave a, a job in a situation where they're unsure. So we have said to our staff today, this is the problem we've got. We would like to discuss with you options you have for either being more flexible, for changing terms and conditions, for amalgamating jobs so that um, we have uh, you know, three people going down to two. We'll obviously need to talk to them about whether we'll offer um, some sort of inducement package. Now, before we even get near redundancy, we'll look at asking for volunteers, we'll look at early retirements, all the things you expect us to do. We've got a comprehensive policy in government on redundancy. The Chief Minister's made it clear redundancy is to be the last resort, and that's exactly what we're following. That's the reason we wrote to the Whitley Council's employee side last week, gave them a table with the post in, told them that it would be early consultation and invited them to attend. Now, we have spoken to 34 people. We have made it clear that we might need 11 now. We might need another 11 next year. That's yet to be confirmed. But I think uh, that it's only fair to tell someone if in a year's time you're worried about their job. If I tell them now and they get an offer of a job in six months, they might prefer to take that knowing that actually there's some questions over their future here. Uh, if I don't tell them, they could pass by a perfectly good opportunity. So I think it's important that we're honest with our staff and we give them opportunities to at least think about helping us out of our problems. Well, I mean, that appears to be clear to me what you just said there, but it obviously didn't seem clear in your letter, possibly, what you were saying or trying to do. Did you agree yes. with that? Uh, I, listening to the tape you've, you, you've, you've played me, it appears not to be clear. Now, I sent two letters last week explaining the position. Uh, yes, there was some, a degree of short notice involved, and I've apologised for, for the lack of time available. Um, uh, we um, regard as our priority our own members of staff. That's why I insisted on meeting them. Yes, there was an offer to, to bring the meeting forward to yesterday afternoon. Uh, that offer was made at 1.30. Um, you have to understand, Paul, as I suspect you do know, um, the railways are quite extensive. Uh, we had people working in Douglas, we had people working up in Ramsey, people down in Port Erin, and on the top of Snaefell. We actually had staff brought in today from the top of Snaefell. Now, with a proposal that we bring the staff meeting forward to 3 o'clock, you know, realistically, both for operational and simply practical reasons, getting 34 people together from across the island in just over an hour, it's going to be a pretty big ask. We'd already made plans to get less people letters at home. My intention had always been give people notice, but not so much notice they worry. I could have written them on Friday, but then they've got the whole weekend to think, what's this meeting about? So our intention was very clearly letter to be delivered to them at work, 
a pan delivered to them by a supervisor. If they weren't at work, we'd pop it to their house for them to come in and meet myself, the Director of Public Transport and the Chief Engineer face to face for a proper explanation this morning. And as your tape clearly shows, that information hasn't yet got back to the, to the employee's side. It's a shame they weren't able to come, but as they say, they had previous commitments. Uh, because uh, news was leaking out onto the forums, because as it turned out there was an emergency keys question, had I delayed things, staff would have found out through the media. Now, for, for all that the media might be a wonderful thing, that's not right. Our staff should hear from me. I'm the chief exec. It's my job. With hindsight, do you think you could have handled it differently? We can always consult earlier and earlier and earlier. We were given, I know there's a reference to the restructure being done in May. That's when we started. We didn't expect a problem then because it all being done by natural wastage. In early January, we were advised and our budget targets were confirmed and we knew that we had to take some much more significant action. We started discussions with the union on the 17th of January. We wrote to them and wrote to them. I accept and have apologised for the fact there was a delay in communicating with the Whitley Council people, but our staff are covered by unions and their representatives were informed on the 17th. This is the initial consultation phase now. And I almost wonder if we're expected to consult on consulting. Mm. And this is a discussion phase. The staff have been told today that we have three weeks, that's what we've set aside for, for meetings and discussions. Some of them came up with money-saving ideas today. They, one of the gents said to me, look, um, you use a contractor to do this. We could do that. We're happy to do it. Why don't you let us do it? Well, if that saves five grand, that's five grand start. I don't know what the value is, but you can get... That's what we're doing. We're talking to our staff to work with them to get them to help us. So at no time were you going to hand out redundancy notices today? I, there's no way I could do that. You know, we have a process to follow in government whereby you go through... Before I even get anywhere near thinking about that, we'll look at um, redeploying people into other departments. We'll look at asking for volunteers. There's absolutely never any intention. And the letters I've all have, always that I've sent to all parties have been, we will start the process of informal consultation. There hasn't even been a decision reached about whether there will be redundancies. We're just being honest with people and saying there may have to be and we are telling you as soon as we know. And would you concur that most of these jobs will be at the bottom of the triangle of the, the whole business? No, I'm afraid I wouldn't concur, Paul, because one of the jobs there, and I'm not going to mention it because there's only one person in it, is a senior engineering job. Across the department we've had jobs at senior civil service level that are currently vacant. So um, we will look anywhere across the department, at any grade, in any role, to find a saving. We need to be driven by the services we offer and the operations we carry out. So if we can do without a job, we certainly will. Uh, and just for clarity, no one has been told they are surplus to requirements. Our staff work hard and we value them. What they have been told is, if at the end of the process there is a staff surplus, then we will have to apply the policy. The phrase staff surplus is what was used. I have certainly not put in a letter that someone is surplus to requirements. Please subscribe to the Isle of Man TV Archive channel. Thank you.